Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, in which EWTN gives me this great privilege every week uh, to hear uh, how God has touched someone's life. I mean, it's a powerful thing. I mean, it really truly is, if you think about it. I mean, we take it so much of our faith for granted. And, uh, and also some of us who've had the great privilege of, of having a walk with Christ. How do we get someone else? How do we get someone else to have the same awakening that we may have had by grace? Of course, that's why Mother Angelica wanted this program, is to help Catholics particularly discover the beauty of their own faith that sometimes we take for granted. Well, I, I've had this great privilege, and I'm very grateful to EWTN for this for all these years. And tonight's program is like so many others. Our guest is Joelle Marin. Marin. Marin, <laughs> make sure I got that last name right, who, uh, for want of a better term, we call her a revert. So she's going to talk about how she was Catholic and then left and came back by the grace of God. So, Joelle, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. My joy to be here. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to be here. I want to tell the audience that you do have a written story already on the chnetwork.org website called Beauty From Ashes, as well as a website, joellemarin.com. All right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, good. Let's, let's start from the very beginning, and let's hear your journey. Yeah, absolutely. So I was actually raised in the faith, born and raised, very devout little girl. <laughs> I prayed, you know, the childlike faith that we have as children that we, like, try to get back the rest of our lives. I just had that faith that could move mountains. I believed everything that I heard in the Bible, and I would pray to the Lord. I felt like I had this direct phone line to Him. It was so precious. Huh. I was also aware of the presence of good and evil at such a young age. Uh, looking back, I, I didn't realize discernment or discernment of spirits, but I could see things going on and, and feel things, oh. and I would pray to the Lord. And so I would see mountains move in my life and prayers being answered. and. The priest came over for dinner often. I'd be like, oh, Jesus is coming for dinner. And they're like, no, that's not Jesus. But I, I kind of <laughs> grasped the, the persona Christi and, and the faith in, in a special way. You could see St. Mary's Catholic Church from our house, from the living room window. <laughs> and my family was very well immersed into the life of the church. I suppose we ought to so. <laughs> begin by saying praise God for your parents. Yeah, well, praise God and also for my grandparents, who oh, I'll go. talk about their prayers are really what led me back to the church and you know, but I was, I was just blessed, I guess looking back, that I was even born into a Catholic family. Uh, but of course we take things for granted yeah. and that, that beautiful childlike faith and that phone line to God eventually got disconnected. And uh, so um, this, it's not really easy to talk about this, but I, but I will share what happened. Did, well, first of all, did, yeah. your, did your childhood Catholic faith uh, carry you through most of your childhood into well, like, okay. This is, this is where we're going with it. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so this is what happened was it, I was six years old. And again, very faithful little girl, prayerful little girl. And it was a week before Christmas. And I kept having these dreams of a house fire. And the first night in my dream, my mother died. And I said, Lord, please don't let my mother die. Hmm. And I woke up and I said, oh, praise God, that was just a dream. And the next night I had a dream of a house fire. And then this night my father died. And I said, Lord, please don't let my father die. And I woke up and I said, praise God, it's just a dream. And I told my mom about the dreams and I just, the image of fire wouldn't leave me. I remember even um, being in the bath thinking, I better hurry up and get out of here. And that night before I went to bed, it was December 18th, a week before Christmas. And um, yeah, I was in New York and I thought, well, God forbid there's a fire tonight and I have to run outside let me wear something warm. I normally wore my dad's Hanes t-shirt to bed, and this <laughs> night I wore a long wool nightgown. Remember, it has a little bow on it. And that night in my dream, my sister died. And I started to pray, and I said, Lord, please don't let Maria, her name was Maria, and before I could say the word die, I woke up to my dad screaming, and you could barely hear him because there was roaring flames. And he was <laughs> saying, Joel, Joel, get out, there's a fire. And the whole front of the house was already gone, and <laughs> so, um, I barely made it out. I somehow made my way into my, my father's arms and he carried me through the flames. Mm. I wasn't burnt, but my sister's doorway had flames all around it. And my dad was trying to get to her, wildly trying mm. to get to her. And his arms were getting all burnt up and he couldn't get into her room. So he threw me down the cellar stairs and told me to go get help. Honestly, mm. as I 
as he threw me down the stairs, I could have broke my neck or something, mm. but I felt this cloud of peace in the mm. midst of the storm actually carry me down the stairs. And, you know, I want to stay true to the story I told the newspapers. I was six years old. This is the story my town knows. This is what happened. Uh, it must have been my guardian angel. I didn't <laughs> see anything. I just, in the midst of chaos, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of these roaring flames, there was peace. So looking back, God was mm. there in this very tragic scene. But as I had gone outside and I'm standing, I'm six years old on the street corner to go to the neighbor's house and get help and then looking at my house almost completely gone because you know, the only way out was the basement and knowing that my dad wasn't getting anywhere with her, I had a choice to make and I was frightened. And so I ran back into the house to save my dad oh, wow. and, yeah. and to bring him out to go get help. But when we got to the neighbors and we tried to call the phone lines were down and the, the fire department, believe it or not, was only a mile down the street. It was on our street, but we couldn't get through. Mm. And by the time we did, you know, they got there and my, they're saying, you know, where is she? Where is she? And my father's screaming to let him go back in. He's trying to hose himself off with water, you know, to go back in. He's stepping on broken glass and he's like, my baby's in there. My baby's in there. Mm. But Maria was 11 years old. And so the firefighters are frantically searching for a baby, throwing dolls out the window. And, you know, where's this baby? And, and finally they found her 11 years old, blonde hair, blue eyes, and really an angelic looking, beautiful girl. And, you know, they rushed her to the hospital. And now I'm in the hospital for smoke inhalation with my father. And we're, we're waiting, waiting. And again, I'm praying and praying and praying. And I said, Lord, please don't let her die. Please don't let her die. And the doctor came in, and I'll never forget that moment because I was there with my dad. And when they told us that she didn't make it, he started screaming and wailing and clutched onto me. And just being the little girl to see the love of a father, to mm. see the pain that he was going through, not even knowing my own yet, it was just too much to bear. Mm. Oh. And so it was at that moment uh, that my whole life was burnt down to the ground. I lost my home, toys, clothes, stuff, right? Yeah. Which is just stuff. But then I lost my sister and I lost my parents because the grief took them away, you know? And so I lost them to depression and just all oh. kinds of things that went on after that where I, I thought my life was not crushed, but smashed to pieces, like literally yeah. smashed. And I said, Lord, you have to do something. And so it was on my seventh birthday, a few months later, I had a great idea. So I thought, um, I had no possessions left, Marcus, everything taken, but people had donated these dolls to me. And one of them, one of the dolls I had actually was saved from the fire. It was my sister's Cabbage Patch doll. That was the thing uh -huh. back then. And it had burn marks on it and, and a, you know, smoky smell, but I treasured it. And so I laid these treasures out on my bed. It's all I had without realizing I was giving God a, an altar of sacrifice. Like, I will give you all my dolls, Lord. I'll give you everything that I have if you just give me my sister back. And so I made it in the shape and size of Maria and I prayed over the dolls and I asked God, please raise her. And I stood there, you know, I'm staring and nothing happened. And so I said, well, maybe you didn't hear me <laughs> because I know I was told you can raise the dead. You can do this, Lord. And so I prayed again over the dolls and nothing happened. And then I was starting to be discouraged, but I'm, I'm a pretty persistent person, <laughs> a little uh -huh. stubborn at times. And so I prayed again. Or please bring her back, raise her. And you know, it was at that moment when he didn't bring her back to life and I knew he could do that, that I wasn't sure I trusted him anymore. Hmm. And I disconnected my phone line to him, which was prayer. Yeah. Wow. And so I, w I went to church with my parents. I still prayed, but just that childlike trust, that hope, it just felt diminished. I, I wasn't sure. And I think we do that a lot in life, right? Like mm -hmm. when we lose something and have grief, we have a choice to make. Do we turn towards God, which is what I should have done, or do we turn away? And there was a nun who I got to speak to, and I said to her, well, you know, why did this happen? And I told her the whole story, and why was I saved, and why wasn't she? And she's telling me how amazing heaven was, and, and, and you're not going to believe it's incredible. Wait till you get there. She's so happy. And I, then I got really angry, and I'm like, well, if heaven's so great, you know, why did I get left behind? I want to go there, too. <laughs> so I was mad at God either way you looked at it. Either I was left here with nothing, you know, or I was missing out on the greatness of heaven. So in your heart, you had 
rejected the reality of God. You just severed your relationship. I was confused. With him and confused. I was and very hung. confused. Why would he do this? Why would he not? And, and all that stuff, right? And, okay. yeah. and you were pretty young when this happened. I was you young, know? yeah. yeah. And, and I've been on stage since I was five years old. My mother had okay. a nonprofit theater company, so she wasn't home the night of the fire. I was wondering about that. And, yeah. you know, she's always blamed herself. No one is to blame. You know, no one yeah, is. This yeah. is, God knew this was going to happen. I, I can't tell you why. I, I can't tell you why God allows things to happen in our lives, but He brings beauty of the, from the ashes. Yeah. He brings good out of everything. It doesn't mean we don't grieve, you know, but. Right, but as a young girl, you know, trying to put it all together was, yeah. was a problem for you. Yeah, so so I started hiding behind characters unhealthily, <laughs> you know, just, well, let me just take on someone else's life because mine was miserable. And so I misused the gifts and graces that the Lord gave me. Um, I was spent a life checking boxes. If I just have this, I'll be happy. If I just do this, I'll be happy. And like I said, I went to church, but my heart was far from the Lord. Our guest is Joelle uh, Marin. I wonder how many people in theater do that <laughs> very thing, you know, because of things that have happened in their life, and so they hide behind the characters they get into, you know. It sounds like what you did a little bit of, right? Yeah. In your own theater, right? Okay. Yeah. So you're involved in theater, and and uh, and the but the church is you you still going to church once in a while and still praying once in a while? Or the, yeah, I mean with the family. Yeah. I okay. went to church when I went to college. I would come back and go for the weekend. There was one right. point I went away to Italy for to study abroad, and when I came back, my grandmother literally took me, or she said to me, you're going to confession. And I said, no, I'm not. Oh yeah, you're going to confession. I'm like, no, I'm not. And she's like, get in the car. And I'm like, okay. And so I got in the car and then I'm standing outside the confessional and I'm like, I'm not going in there. No, this is not happening. And she's like, you're going in there. I said, I'm not going in there. She took me by my hair and threw me in. I came stumbling in. I'm like, hello, father. Like, this is normal that you get thrown into a confessional. And you know, to be honest, looking back, I'm so happy. That's the, one of the best things anyone's ever done for me. <laughs> and I joke around, I tell people, if they're hesitant to go to confession, I'll throw you in by your hair because <laughs> we need that. And although I wasn't probably in the best place to tell the priest everything, I know I walked out of there lighter. I know that I walked out there, again, with just the, a little <laughs> bit of grace. Had my heart been more open, it would have been more. But quickly, after all these little ways that I met God throughout the years, I would continue to fall away. It's like I would try to come close and then, or someone would push me close and then I'd back up. But my, but my grandparents never stopped praying for me. <laughs> they never gave up. And they, you know, my grandmother prayed three rosaries a day, Divine Mercy Chaplet at three o'clock every day. And I think it's important that we never give up our prayer for people. And I think I'm a testament of that. You think someone is so far lost, but the moment that grace open, you know, their heart is open, all that grace will enter in. And so I got to the place of just acquiring stuff, like I said, and one sin led into another sin that led into another sin. So staying away from the sacraments, mm. away from the church, I had become blinded. Mm. And I really, I want to say I had complete amnesia, like a spiritual amnesia, a breakdown of self, a loss of self, mm. uh, especially in that business as well being judged on what you look like and how much money you, you can make someone. Time, right? And I was a model as yeah. well. I, I modeled for Jergens and Target and had a billboard in Times Square. And again, checkbox, checkbox, checkbox. <laughs> and it sounds so glamorous, but it wasn't. We don't talk about uh, the rejection in that business. We don't talk about yeah. the competition, the comparison. And I would go to auditions and since they're casting someone with my color hair, my color eyes, my height, We'd all look like each other. And then to make it worse, we would check out, well, what is she wearing? What is she wearing? Oh, what color is her lipstick? And then you go on the next audition and we could have been like twins, triplets, <laughs> quadruplets. <laughs> Instead of just being who we were created to be, because we didn't know anymore. I didn't know anymore. Yeah. And so I tried to be an image of what the world said was beautiful, what the world said was important, what the world said was special. And to the point yeah. that I had nothing. Hmm. Because we get so focused on the externals, the externals, that yeah. the, in, the inside pretty soon gets empty and empty. And our Lord talked about that, you know, yeah. that uh, uh, don't just wash the outside of the cup. Yeah. That's what's on the, it's on the what's inside. It's what's on the What's going on in the heart. Yes. And uh, if you can check enough boxes on the outside, you don't worry about the heart anymore. 
Yeah, and when you're in sin and you and your heart is hardened, you can't even see it anymore. And so I think that's the scary part is in my mind, I was still praying, even though it was, Lord, I want this, I want that, I want to work with this celebrity, I want to do this. I was really bossy with God, really disrespectful. Looking back, I felt so bad after my reversion of how I treated God. But it was like he was this genie in a bottle and I'll put you back on a shelf when I'm done. <laughs> and, you know, the things of the world don't satisfy. So keeping away from the Lord, keeping away from the sacraments in the church, I was just getting more and more broken to the point I had two beach houses. I thought that was going to do it. You know, a beautiful home in Austin with an Italian courtyard and all this stuff accumulating, accumulating, accumulating while losing myself. Pretty much I felt like I was losing my soul. And I got out to Los Angeles at this, at this one point. I, now I had owned a cosmetic company. It's a crazy story <laughs> of, of, you know, but somehow I end up as the CEO of a cosmetic company and I'm on top of a rooftop in Hollywood with the Hollywood sign behind me doing a photo shoot with a $4,000 dress on. And so <laughs> it looked like another checkbox. You've made it. This is wonderful mountaintop moment, you know. And I will never forget, There was I was looking in a compact mirror and I saw my reflection, but I knew how I felt inside. Have you ever looked in the mirror and you're like, that doesn't match how I'm feeling no, today, no. <laughs> good or bad, right? It happens right. to all of us, but this was just an utter shock. What looks so glamorous to the world, what looks so wonderful was nothing. I was so broken and so hurt and so lost and so empty and so lonely. It looked like I had all these friends. It was surface <laughs> relationships. It wasn't community. And that night I went out. I was on Rodeo Drive. I'm meeting with celebrities. Everywhere I turned, it was a temptation after a temptation. And I don't know how I escaped. It was by the grace of God that I got out of a lot of trouble that night. Mm. But I ended up back at my hotel room at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was just so broken. Mm. And I spent hours and hours crying on this hotel, this uh, shower floor in this fancy hotel in West Hollywood, mm. just bawling my eyes out. Now, this was the first prayer, a first true prayer that I said in years. Mm. And I said, Lord, I need you. I don't have this anymore. Mm. I don't know who I am. Do you know me? Do you know my name? Mm. Like it was just that true repentance and cry from the heart. The Greeks call it metanoia, right? A change mm. in heart that leads to a change in action. I was finally ready. You know, before I was trying to control everything, I was trying to make my own happiness, which by the way, the world will try to sell you that message. Yeah. There's speakers out there that will try to sell you that message. No, we can't buy happiness. We can't make happiness. True joy lives within us. It's, yeah. God, it's God within. And, I, and I, I finally got to the point where I was like, nothing I'm doing is working, Lord. I need help. And that's a grace that you came to that spot. It, I find it amazing. It, it, yeah. uh, that often when I'm not thinking about it when I'm preparing for the Journey Home program, it just so happens that I happen to be reading things that connect with what happens in, in, an, in a program. Yeah. And I just happened to be reading this morning the book Ecclesiastes, mm. where the author, who supposedly Solomon, uh, has reached the top of his life, and all of a sudden he realizes everything is vanity. Yeah, it's all vanity. Everything, it's all vanity, all this stuff, all that I've become, all my wisdom, uh, everything is just vanity. And I'll, in fact, he says, and everything I've worked hard to make, I'm just going to die and pass on to somebody else. It's all yes. vanity. And what's interesting about the story, if you if you put that Ecclesiastes in the life of Solomon, mm -hmm. at the top of his, if that's where he's writing that, the yeah. story we have is that the next chapter, he blew it. Yeah. He blew it and everything, he lost everything because he made the wrong choice. Sounds like, on the one hand, the Lord awakened your heart to it's all vanity, <laughs> but you turned to Him and said, Lord, help me. F finally. <laughs> yeah, praise finally. God. And so it was, I really believe it was that moment in the shower where I opened my heart to true prayer that all the graces, all the prayers mm -hmm. that my grandparents and family had prayed all those years rushed in. And so when I returned back to Austin from Hollywood, I was literally wide awake, walking through my bathroom on the way to my closet. And this... Oh my goodness, this, it's taken me years. This happened in 2012. And so I still can't wrap my mind around this, but I saw my whole life flash before my eyes. It was kind of like this near death experience. And I saw all my sins in full light. I saw who followed me 
who followed them, who followed them, like the layers deep of everything that we do in life. And I didn't know the ripple effect of our actions. I did. I, I don't sugarcoat this, Marcus. It was horrifying. Mm. Oh, it broke my heart because I thought I had a free ticket to heaven. I thought I was a really good person. And if you'd know me back then, you know, people that knew me said, well, you weren't bad, you were good, but I was so selfish because mm. what I was shown was that my good column, the column to love, the column to be who I was created, created to be, and the column to use the gifts and graces that God gave me to build the mm. kingdom was nearly empty. Mm. And then it had been all about me. And I didn't know at the time, it took me years to process this. I immediately got a spiritual director, and I'll get to that in a minute. But St. Faustina talks about it. She even had to have, now she was in a, her soul was in a better state than mine. And even she said, who could stand before the thrice holy God and see the state of their soul? It's kind of like this illumination of how God sees your soul. So if she was scared with the little sins that were on her soul, imagine someone like me who was blinded and lost in sin to see they haven't loved. And quite honestly, I deserved hell. I would have thrown myself into hell. God does not condemn. This is a beautiful story of mercy, Hmm. but that's what I had earned. And I believe that you can't separate justice and mercy. And that's where the justice was, is that when, when we see our souls, and we see whether or not we love St. John of the Crosses in the evening of our life will be judged on love alone. And I saw that. Mm. And then the most wild part of this was I was shown that the good column weighed more than my worst sin. And I didn't know the scripture, love covers a multitude of sins. And that really, I've, I've taken years to just kind of contemplate that and think, well, wow. And then I figured out if we are filling our good column, if we're loving, if we're being who God created us to be, then we're not sinning. We don't have time for sin. Mm. And so really that's kind of like that awakening moment just changed the course of my life forever because I don't want other people to have their soul in a state that mine was in and have to face God like that. No, light, you said it, life is short. Yeah. Our time here is short. Eternity is forever. Now is the time to change. And I really, I feel like I'm on borrowed time. I still feel like this is so urgent because I could I could die walking out of here. I pray I don't. But <laughs> but we don't know. And the legacy that I want to leave behind is love. I want to leave behind my, when my grandmother, she passed away last year. She left a legacy of love. That's all we have. You know, how have we helped others? Are we being kind? Are we coming together as a church? Are we judging? Are mm-hmm. we looking for the good or bad in each other? Are we just out for ourselves? Are we checking boxes? And yeah, another so, thing I read this morning, which connects, so I happen to be reading in the yeah. Office of Readings, and, it, and uh, the, in, in the wonderful book, Imitation of Christ, he makes this comment that it's more important that we focus on a holy death than a long life. Yeah. And most of us, that's all we focus on, a long life, and filling it with stuff, yeah. and recognizing what kind of a life are we presenting before the Lord. So you're having this Let's go back into your story. Oh, You're, sure. You go back to Austin and you have this awakening, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing it didn't change overnight. No, well, after this experience, yeah. the first thing I did, because it, it freaked me out, I was scared, I was frightened. I said, what, what, did the, what was this? What happened to me? So I started reading the Bible from front to back in two months, and I don't <laughs> recommend reading it from front to back because I'm getting through the Old Testament. I'm like crying, and I'm like, oh my goodness, that's me, I turned away from God. And so luckily, I eventually got to the New Testament, and I kept reading about the temple, that Jesus got lost in the temple. And that was that became my prayer was the search for the temple. I said, Lord, I want to get lost in your temple. I want to hear from the teachers. Now at this time I was Christian. And by the way, I told everyone I was Catholic because I went maybe if I went to New York for a holiday, I went to church. So I was Catholic, not. Uh, I, but I was still Christian, and I was singing in a Christian, like a kind of a non-denominational church at the time, on stage. I mean, <laughs> you know, but I wish I could say it was for the glory of God. But no, I was an idol of worship up on the stage. I had auditioned to get in. Uh, I had to sign a contract, it's, and it was really yeah. kind of fun and, and glamorous. And I will say, good people there. I would call it more of a pep rally for God. That's what my mother called it, the service. So it's not that it was bad. It's just that something was missing. I'm like, Mm. where's the crucifix? Where's the cross? So when I'm reading the Bible and I'm reading about the temple and the church that I was going to wasn't open during the day and did not look like a temple. It was just like a big square building with no crosses, no images. (laughs) 
like, where's Jesus? I, I need to find Jesus. And the Catholic Church kept coming to mind. <laughs> And so that was the beginning of my return home. Now, of course, I said, oh, I'm going to start going to daily mass. And a week went by and I didn't get there. And then another week. But I eventually made my way back to the church. And I'll never forget my first time back. And I didn't know you had to go to confession first. I'll get to that (laughs) in just a bit. But I went and received the Eucharist. And the peace of God filled my soul. And I was like, I'm finally home. Like, I just knew. I just knew. I was like, this is what I was looking for because I finally was receiving the Lord in a state of openness to receive the graces. And I think a lot of times we wonder, well, how do people go to church and they're not receiving the graces? And I think it's because our hearts aren't open. Yeah. So. Well, the, that's kind of the way I've come to interpret the Beatitudes based on some teachings from some early church fathers is that you, you see the Beatitudes as a, uh, as a stepping stones, okay? So the yeah. first one, which is poverty in spirit, which means uh, uh, a detachment from the world. Yeah. And then mourning for our sin is a detachment from sin. And then the next one is, uh, you know, uh, the meek. So that's detachment from self. Mm-hmm. And it's it, it, through detachment from the world and sin and self, now you got some space in your heart <laughs> for uh, for the hunger for righteousness. And that's yeah. what you're talking about, is yes. that, that sometimes God can't reach you because your heart's so full of the junk. Yeah. yeah, and so now I was I was so hungry. <laughs> you talk about having a hungry heart and truly being fed by the Eucharist. And, you know, with this realization, that was one of the most terrible things of all the years, aside from all my sin, was that I missed all those Holy Communions. Yeah, and all those confessions. And all those confessions, <laughs> yes. Why don't we take a break now, Joelle, and we'll come back in a moment and pick up, because again, as I said, we have these awakenings, but we don't change overnight. And so how do we start digging away the inside of it? And be great, glad to hear your story. We'll come back in a moment and hear the rest of Joelle's story. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Joelle Marin, right? Marin. Good, Marin. Good. So we've, we, we've paused you in your story. You, you're, you've pretty much kind of come back. And as we mentioned yes. last time, just coming back is the start. Yeah, it was the start. It's not the <laughs> end. <laughs> We're never done. Yeah. It was the beginning of a new life in Christ, a beginning of rejoining the community, and also the beginning of a deep healing. Yeah. And so as I started going to daily Mass, my heart got convicted, you know, you really need to go to confession. Mm-hmm. And this time, not by my grandmother throwing me in <laughs> by my hair, but to go by my own free will, that I was ready to really talk to a priest about all the detours I had made and to let God's healing love and light go in those places. And so I worked up the courage to go. You probably should make an appointment if you're going to do a general confession. <laughs> but I was just lucky to even get myself there because I was very nervous my first time back to confession. It was so much to say out loud and to give to the Lord. And so really by the time I went in, I was in there way over an hour that everyone else in the line left. Uh I kind of felt bad. I wasn't trying to be selfish, but I didn't know it was going to take that long and just more and more had had come up. I know we're not going to ask what you said in there, but that experience, and some may wonder, was that where you were spilling your guts or was the... Were you responding? Was the priest asking you questions to guide through that? No, it was literally (laughs) an hour or two of me giving everything. And I even wrote it all down on a paper and front and back. It was just covered with all this stuff because I didn't want to leave anything out. So it truly was a general confession. And I was just ready to give it all to the Lord. But after what I will say the priest said to me is he said, when you leave here, Joelle, the enemy is going to try to convict you that you are not forgiven. And he said, but once God forgives, he forgets and you are forgiven. He mm. said, so don't believe the lie and don't, he just, it's just, mm. it's so funny. He knew and I thought, well, that's kind of weird. He's saying this. I don't know what he's talking about, but he, sure He might've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you kind of, yeah. And I got home and sure enough, I still, even though I had gone, I hadn't yet felt the weight of my sin lift. Mm. And I just really felt still felt very terrible about all the things that I did. I had trouble forgiving myself. Yeah. 
And so I went online again. I'm at this point, I've read the Bible. I've read the whole catechism. I'm all the answers to life are in all these <laughs> two sources. And I'm like, oh, I wish I knew this. I wish I knew this. <laughs> but I was still being hard on myself. And so I found some more prayers online. I'm reading every prayer. And then I had read fasting is so important, which I think mm. as a culture, we forgot everything's about, oh, feed me, <laughs> feed my hungry, whatever, you know, hearts, desires. But I, fasting is so powerful. And so I decided to fast and go back to confession a week later to confess that I didn't feel forgiven. And that, you know, because you don't have to repeat all those sins. Thank God. Praise God no, that I no, didn't no. have to say all those things again. But um, after I left this time, now I prayed, I fasted, I was really made the choice to forgive myself and also to forgive, the Lord doesn't need forgiveness, but to forgive Him for allowing me to be in those situations that caused harm and all the people that also hurt me, to just say, I'm ready to let go, it's just weighing me down. And so when I came home from that confession, I was in my bedroom by the side of my bed and I was on my knees, again, still in pain, you see, I had to return to the church, but there was still so much pain and healing that I needed. And I was crying out to God. Like, I don't even think I've ever, like, wailing, crying. And without thinking of it, I remember shocking myself. The words, Abba, Abba, came flying out of my mouth. I wouldn't be surprised if the neighbors could hear this. And this is, like, loud, wailing and crying. And I'm like, Abba, Abba. And I'm thinking, what does that mean? Why am I saying Abba? You know, and, and as a child, I knew Abba Father and the song in church, but yeah. here I didn't know in Romans that the, the spirit of adoption cries out within us, Abba Father, and that we're adopted children of God. And what the Lord was restoring was my identity. So this is, must be the Holy Spirit crying out through me. And it was in that moment that I had another deep encounter with the Lord. I, this is the first time I guess I'm, uh, it's going to be in my book, so I'll, yeah. I'll share the truth of what happened. It's yeah. my reality. Um, I did see the Lord appear to me wow. as a fortress over me, and it wasn't like little Jesus. It was like a fortress protecting me, my protector, you know, covering me, and this luminous, uh, I don't even know how to say that, a color, blue color light that I had never seen before, like just power and glory, and his hands were down, and the power was coming out of his hands like I'm protecting you, I love you, you know, I'm with you, uh, I accept you. And just that feeling, it was, um, I kind of like fell back by the side of my bed and I just felt washed new. I don't know how to, exp how to explain something like this, but I felt the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, just fill and radiate my being. And literally it was like the darkness that was still, I felt attached to me, it's like I got up and walked out of the room. That was just like the greatest light. And I wish I could tell you that I could keep that feeling the rest of my life too. <laughs> but that's not the story of he to healing. But it was this great grace where I really felt like God was saying, and not just to me, but now I, in our ministry, as I look at people and I see wherever we are, that He meets us, that He comes down to us, that He loves us and has a plan for our lives and wants to reinstate that identity of children of God. That's what I was missing. See, all those years, I lost the belt of truth. The belt that told me that I belonged, that I had a purpose, that there's nothing I could do that could stop God's love, that unconditional love. And so it was in that moment that it was like all that just washed away. And I really felt that I had a new start. But then, you know, you want to stay on the mountaintop <laughs> and you think that's going to last. But it, that's not the spiritual life. There's ups and there's downs. And so I had gotten a spiritual director. I shared all this with the, actually it was the priest that I went to confession to. I made an appointment with him. And he's like, I'm telling him, well, I'm still, I had this great encounter. I feel renewed, but then there's moments of doubt and fear. And now I don't know what, what does God want to do in my life? Where do I go from here? And he's told me I should go to the Adoration Chapel and go pray and just really develop a deeper relationship with the Lord to find out what is the next step. So I'm like, oh yeah, I'll go to the Adoration Chapel. And I'm thinking, what's the Adoration Chapel? <laughs> I had no idea. And I did follow the signs on the church campus and found the Adoration Chapel. I walked in, everyone's really quiet. So I'm like, I better pretend I know what I'm doing. I knelt down real quick, I closed my eyes. I saw a statue of Our Lady in the corner. I didn't even see the monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament in it in front of my eyes. I still was so blind, right? And so I just <laughs> shut my eyes, I pretended. And I felt, again, p the peace of God that I just, I, I said, when I go home, I need to Google what is an Adoration Chapel because it was the room that stood still. 
And when I went online and I saw that, I, oh my goodness, Jesus, the body, blood, soul, and divinity was right in front of me. No wonder I felt his peace, but I still didn't see it. And so I started to frequent adoration. And one time I went with a pen and paper and I said, Lord, like, I'm not leaving here until you tell me what lies are in my heart. They're mm. keeping me back from really like mm. staying free in this new identity as your child. Like, what is it? And so I start writing. One thing comes to mind, another thing, another thing. I thought oh, there'd be a few things. It was over 80 lies on this sheet of paper and I ran out of room and I said, oh my goodness, it's so, it's wild what we hold in our hearts and our minds, the beliefs about ourselves, or maybe someone said something to us throughout the years where we didn't feel enough or, you know, fill in the blank. I'm not whatever enough or God would never love me. God would never use me. It wasn't that I, I came out of this experience. I'm like, all right, Lord, you're, you use me. I'm so amazing. No, I felt like nothing again. My life was burnt down to the ground again, but now in a new and a special way. And as I started to give those lies to the Lord and allow His truth to bless me, right, as we should be here reading the scripture, what does God have to say about us? Not what the world has to say, the people that you can never, never be enough or satisfy, but what does God have to say? That's when, again, I went into deeper and deeper healing and I began to get involved in church ministries and someone asked me to be a spiritual chair of a mom's group and I thought, I have to pray out loud with people? Are you serious? <laughs> <laughs> I have to do this? And I was singing in music ministry for a little bit and some things changed course. And so I got involved in evangelization and in ministry. And I really, that's where I felt alive. And I actually didn't, by the way, share my story for two years huh. because I was scared. I was hiding behind the pillar in church when I sang in the <laughs> choir this time instead of being on, on the stage with a band. I was hiding in the pew and I actually had made a vow to the Lord that I would never go on TV or film again or any or on stage again because I thought it was all bad and evil because that was the experience. I was I was wondering what I happened had. because of this. What about your career that you had gotten so involved in? What Yeah, I was I, there a a connect disconnect there or what? I couldn't do it anymore and especially with the cosmetic company I couldn't put eyeliner on people and say oh yeah your problem in life is that you don't know how to draw your eyeliner on I'm like no your <laughs> problems are so much deeper than your eyeliner and I wanted to, to help them and so I started talking more about inner beauty yeah. and people were like are you selling makeup or God they were very confused and I'm <laughs> like well so I knew the Lord was working in my heart and for years I'd worked with children at a homeless shelter and giving them inspirational talks and speaking. So I didn't understand how everything was unraveling, yeah. but God is the master mm. of all these pieces in our life. And so little by little, I, I prayed and I said, I can't do this anymore. I just, it was such a heavy task to try to be this other person that wasn't me. And so again, I let go of everything. And sometimes I think we're afraid that if we give our dreams to God, if we let go of everything, we think he's gonna smash them, right? Mm -hmm. But what he does is something, he could see something so much more beautiful and has an amazing plan that we can't. And so that is my story is that I was scared to death. I closed the doors to my cosmetic company in December, 2015. So it was a three and a half year discernment, again, growing oh. a ministry to go into full-time ministry and guess what? I had nothing lined up. Full-time ministry doing what? <laughs> and so uh, through prayer, I felt the Lord calling me to youth ministry. And I thought that the message that he had gifted me with is one that the youth really need to hear. And I'd worked with the homeless youth. So I put a resume together. I showed it to someone I really trust. They looked at me, they crumbled it up and threw it at me. And they said, no one will ever hire you as a youth minister. And I thought, oh, wow, well, maybe I discerned wrong. I went back to prayer. Well, sure enough. Did they give reasons or because you didn't you're have not, I'm not qualified. What yeah, model yeah. and actress becomes yeah. a youth minister? Okay. And by the way, director of confirmation, it makes no sense, right? So I get it, but this was what the, this is yeah. a, now with a relationship of God, he's redirecting, he redirects our lives, right? So I had in the, also in this time, had joined the Carmelites, the secular order of the Discalced Carmelites, OCDS. And How'd that happen? Yeah, so another thing, I was just, some. the priest said something about St. Teresa of Avila, Google, you know, went yeah. online, and I started reading Interior Castle in the Way of Perfection. And when I read Interior Castle, I was like, this is what I'm experiencing. This, I understood St. Teresa of Avila. Mm -hmm. A lot of people 
can't follow her writings because she's here and she's there. I'm like, she she speaks like me. She's all over the place. I love <laughs> this. And and I really took her as my patron saint at that time. And and so I didn't know there was a secular order, but in my heart, I was like, well, I wanted to be a Carmelite nun. I'm like, well, you can't do that because I had children. And so that wasn't possible, but I really had this desire. And then I found out they were having an event called How Does Your Garden Grow? It was a prayer event. And so I was like, well, I have to go find out more about this. And I went to the Carmelite event and I signed up for this an advanced prayer class. So <laughs> I have to laugh at myself. <laughs> what did I know about advanced prayer? I didn't, <laughs> but I'm, I'm kind of an all or nothing kind of person and that's just my personalities. But then I got there and right away the enemy was like, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. You know, it was kind of that, that voice in my head saying, who are you? You don't even know how to pray. And so I'm crying, I'm thinking, maybe I don't know how to pray, I should just bolt out the door. But I spoke to a friar and he's like, no, that's not God's voice speaking. You're supposed to be here today, you stay. And I went to the workshop and I was like, oh, like I just, I, again, I felt at home again. And so by the grace of God, I, I went through a discernment process. So I did make my first promises. I spent four years uh, in the order. And if God wills, I'll return one day. But because of my speaking schedule yeah. and travel, yeah. I can't make the Saturday meetings, which means you can't really be part of the community if you can't make it. So if God wills, one day I'll make final promises. Uh, but it's according to your state in life. So I took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I could still get married, you yeah. know, and all of that. It's according to your state of life. The nuns are cloistered, so it's different. Yeah. But I'm thinking maybe the key thing was the spirituality. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that helped you. Well, when I walked in the door, I mean, it was really part of my journey. It was part of my healing. When I saw the love of the Carmelites and I saw the purity of that and how we learned to pray for each other and I got to pray for them and I got to be a part of that is when I really started to see the face of Christ as well. So I, I was encountering him in the sacraments. I was encountering him in the community and in the church and, and all these things that I started to participate in. And then when I met the Carmelites, they just ooze love because they have a deep prayer life. And so we would open our meetings with 30 minutes in silence. And I'm, I'm a contemplative at heart and it just <laughs> felt so natural and so beautiful. And I learned to stop thinking about myself, but it became the question, how can I pray for others? How can I serve? How can I help others? And my heart began to burn for these things. So you, you ended up though in that youth ministry. Right? Yeah, so, so then, this is amazing, is I ended up going to a different church for daily mass. It wasn't my normal church. And I saw one of my Carmelite sisters who, I know she's very smart. And so I went up to her after mass and I said, I need help with my resume. I said, I feel like I'm supposed to be a youth minister, but it looks terrible. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And she said, you're not going to believe this, but the youth minister of this parish just put his notice in. It's not even posted yet. So I thought, that's it. I got, I got the job. I got the job. This is what I'm thinking. So she's like, let me introduce you to the priest. And so she introduced me to him and he's like, tell her to send in her resume. He was kind of busy. <laughs> I started crying. I thought, oh, Lord, I thought that like this was a done deal. And so he actually, he interviewed a lot of people. They did post it. But when God wants you to do something, he opens that door. And so when I got there, I knew I wasn't there permanently. I just knew it was part of the journey. And so I was very honest from day one. I said, I don't know why I'm here. This is just was in my prayer and I'm here. I'll do my best. <laughs> I tried to use all the skills God gave me uh, to help in this ministry and to build a team. We had an amazing team of volunteers. It's about new, if I'm here one year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years, I'm just here. And so that lasted three years when the Lord called me into full-time speaking because I couldn't balance. I was actually bringing the teens to an event that I was doing a keynote at and I couldn't balance it anymore. And it was through the youth ministry that I realized that I'm a speaker an evangelist and eventually the Lord called me back into film and television as part of healing and evangelism. So it's all under that umbrella and now for His glory. So but, um, so it's only been a little while yet that you've been involved with that, right? I mean, you're just... December 2015. Okay, yeah. so the last six years so, you've been doing that. All right. Yeah. How do you help young girls particularly with the, with the beauty world, you know, <laughs> in terms of their faith? Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? How do you give advice to young girls that that are really they see all the glamour, they see it all in television and movies, and, yeah. and they're trying to understand how do I live, how do I keep my faith, and let that guide me as you move in. It's it's really not easy at all. I love that Saint Augustine has a quote that love is the beauty of our soul. Hmm. 
And so without that love, we really can't be beautiful. Hmm. And I te tell my daughter all the time, I'm like, a real princess isn't just beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, and that is what matters. So I think that you could put all the makeup you want on, and there's nothing wrong. I, you know, I wear makeup. It's okay to dress nice. My grandmother was known yeah. for dressing, you know, very beautiful. But if you're not confident in who you are inside, if you don't feel comfortable in your own skin, it doesn't matter what the outside looks like. If you're not loving, if you die tomorrow and we're judged on love, it doesn't matter what you did for yourself. It matters how did you use, if you're beautiful, how did you use your gifts to bring people to God? And we all have that beauty. And I've interviewed so many men. And I try to tell the girls this, that men are meant to take, and I teach, I also have my certification in the Catechesis on Human Love, and I teach the certification classes for the Diocese of Austin as well. So God has just redeemed and resurrected all this <laughs> crazy stuff with theology of the body and our bodies and dressing and modesty, which was part of what I was shown that I was leading people in the wrong direction in that vision yeah. I had with the Lord because I wasn't dressed right. And what I learned is that modesty protects our core. You know, it's, and it's in the catechism. It helps us to be more fully present and more fully aware so that people are focusing on the person and not just the outside. And so I try to tell the girls this. That when, and when I interview so many men, they're looking for, they think it's so attractive for a woman to be confident and just to be her because men are built to be so visual and to take in the beauty and the mystery of a woman. They're just I, they're like, no, there's no certain shape or size or color hair or color eyes. All women are mysterious and beautiful to a man. So if we stop trying to impress a culture view of men, you know, when they market to women, they're showing us stick figure models. That's not even necessarily what men are attracted to. So we're trying to be an image of something that's not even real, hmm. no less attainable. And I spent years when I was in Hollywood as an actress at 97 pounds for like five oh, years. Wow. and. I still didn't feel beautiful. It doesn't make you feel beautiful anyway, no matter how thin you are, no matter what you do. But I was so tired because I wasn't eating enough calories. I couldn't even go on auditions or do anything. And so sometimes we, we really need to remember that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit and we need to protect them and we need to use them in the way that God has given us to bring Him glory. And when we do that, we will start to shine. And so the very best thing that we can do to be beautiful is to be alive in the personality and, and with the mm -hmm. gifts and talents that God gave us because as St. JP2 says, we're all unique and unrepeatable. And that is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And that builds the kingdom in the body of Christ. So, you know, we all have your good columns going to look different than my good column and everyone listening. Like all of our good columns, all of our gifts, all of our graces, our, our purposes, our personalities, it's going to look different, but it's going to build the body of Christ. And, and it gets us back to what is Holy Communion. And I think that's where we need to be right now to realize that we're just one person but we're all little lights. And if all of our lights were glowing and sparkling, think of what that would do to the whole world. <laughs> you, I, I almost hesitant to ask this question, but yeah. I, I'm wondering if an, the audience, because you did notice, you did mention a daughter, yeah, and you mentioned a mother's group, yeah. and that wasn't really a part of your journey that you shared. It was was that a part of, of, of some of the negative that happened in the process? Did you have a, a, a marriage that, yeah, so I actually, I uh, went through the annulment process and okay. I'm on the annulment pathway to healing team. And I tell my kids, they're the- But that was God, a part of that- the, It, the it was a part here. of the brokenness, yeah. a part of the healing. And uh, at some point, maybe three books from now, <laughs> I'd like to write a book for women who have been divorced and, 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 and really encourage them, first of all, to go through the annulment process. Yeah. And it's not easy, it's painful, but it helps put the pieces together. I think as a church, we need to be real, really more welcomed. I have to say mm -hmm. that there were, there's a lot of misinformation in the church. I actually had a Carmelite say, you can't go to the Eucharist because you're divorced. And no, that's not true. That's not true yeah. And since 52 plus percent of Catholics are divorced, the practicing number of Catholics, it goes down to like 30 something percent. But so many people have been divorced, okay? It's a sad situation because mm -hmm. the family is the image of God. And we know that. But we don't always know discernment. We don't know why things happen. And so when you go back and put the puzzle pieces together, you'll see that something was missing where it's not necessarily sacramental. We need to be so loving and so welcoming and not to, to treat people that have been through that um, as a leper. 
And I think we do that a lot. You know, you could have somebody walking down the communion aisle who might be cheating on their spouse, and then we're treating the divorced person like a leper, and there's a yeah. disconnect, and we yeah, have to annulment. love. We have to love. The, the reality of an annulment, the process, yeah. what it does is affirm the church's commitment to marriage. I mean, yeah. that's really what it yes. does. It's really holding up marriage and the sacramental aspect of marriage, and it's not taking it flippantly. No, that's why there's an no. If, you know, if it took it flippantly, there wouldn't be an annulment process. Yes. It takes it very seriously. And the problem is people come from other churches where sadly it is taken mm -hmm. very flippantly. Yeah. So. And and now I actually, I teach the marriage prep classes as well for the diocese, <laughs> and I get to share with the, the couples preparing <coughs> for marriage and just say, these, this is what you need to look for. Here's the discernment, and God needs to be at the center of all this. Like, this is a sacrament, this is beautiful. And so I can't tell you uh, that I didn't go through years of fear, feeling like yeah. a failure or shame, or that was part of the healing. But to now see that God is, can resurrect everything yeah. and anything in our lives for His glory, and now I understand the beauty of a family and the beauty of marriage. Yeah, well, you, you have a daughter. Yeah, and a son. And, and a son. No, I better not leave him out. He's You're, very even, Stephen. Right. So I mean, they're, they're the beauty. They're, There's a gift. They are the yeah. gift, and and so God works with us. And if I didn't have my children, my life wouldn't be what it is. I just adore them. So let's see if we can slip in an email we have here from Maria from yeah. Ontario. She writes, "I've been away from the church for a while and have lived a pretty worldly life in my years away. I haven't been a, to confession since I was eight years old, and frankly, I'm afraid. First of all." Mm -hmm. of sharing my years of sinful living and out loud, but also that some of the things I've participated in are unforgivable. Mm -hmm. How do you summon the courage to go back to confession? Wow, that's a powerful question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, everything is forgivable. And that, you know, Jesus died to save us. And so we want to really honor his sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that he made on the cross for us. And so there's nothing that we've ever done that make us too far gone or lost yeah. that God can't redeem. Like we are redeemed children of the Lord. As far as being nervous about going back, <laughs> it, you know, the first time you go, it is difficult to say these things out loud, but when we say stuff out loud and we give it to the Lord, when we choose to forgive others and to forgive ourselves, we are now giving the power, we're taking the power away from the sin out of our lives and we're transferring that power into the kingdom of God. He reigns in our lives. And so it really is a transfer of letting the Holy Spirit live and reign to be in a state of grace. When you can receive the sacraments in a state of grace, then we're able to not sin as much, right? And so when we go back to confession, hopefully, God willing, <laughs> it's smaller sins. And 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 over time, I think St. Padre Pio says to go every week if you could, because our room gets dusty after a week. <laughs> we're always in need of that healing. It is a healing sacrament. But to not be afraid, and you know, some people still go, you can go behind a screen if you want. I personally sit and talk to the priest and face to face, you know, he's in Persona Christi, because I don't, I want to have a conversation and I don't want to be ashamed of my sin. I want to give it to the Lord and trust in his mercy. And that's what it comes down to is when we step out in faith and believe that God is who he says he is, then his love and his mercy can reign in our lives and his light can shine. Often I get the question, uh, what's the most common reason on the Journey Home program well, why people say they came back to the church? And there's lots mm -hmm. of answers to that. But I, I thought just we only have a minute or so left. Yeah. Maybe to have you talk about the power of prayer. The people have been praying for you. Yeah. I wish we had more than a minute. <laughs> Like I said, my family never gave up on me, especially my grandparents. And today's my grandmother's birthday who's wow. in heaven. So. You know, she's still praying. This is why I'm here sharing this story. Uh, if it wasn't for her prayers, I wouldn't be here at all today. If it wasn't for my sister's death, I probably wouldn't be here. So this is where God takes, it's not that he wants bad things to happen, but where he take, um, builds oh. beauty from the ashes. And we can't ever give up praying for others. And so we may have people in our lives that we think are too far lost or too far gone and they're never going to come back. But when we pray, it is, it is, it's a true connection to God. We're in communion with Him. He hears our prayers and in His timing, they'll be answered. Joelle, thank you. Thank you. Thank God you. bless you. And once again, Joelle Marin, I'm going to get it right, <laughs> dot com.
is your yes, website. Joelmarin.com. Joelmarin.com. Uh, J-O-E-L-L-E-M-A-R-Y-N. Com. That's why I always had a hard time make sure I get it right because the why was in there. Make sure. You get it. Look, thank you for sharing your journey on thank our program you. and our prayers are with you as you continue to, to use your gifts for the glory of God. Thank, thank you, you very much. God. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Joelle's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you.